Father, open up our minds and show us the things that are unseen by our intellect, but are revealed by your Spirit into our hearts. Those things that you have commanded the disciples pass on through the church age into our church here today, that we might be the salt and light, that we might be your hand and feet to this world. God, help us to understand, help us to move to our feet and to engage in this life as you have. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. This is the story of Jesus coming into and out of Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho, he saw a blind man. So a blind man heard of him and called out to him, and he stopped, and he healed the blind man. So that is the gist of the story. And Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? If Jesus were to ask you that question, what is the one thing that you want Jesus to do for you? If Jesus shows up and asks you, what do you want me to do for you? The gospel is the message from God to our broken world that he loves us and sent his son to redeem us by opening our eyes so that we would see Jesus. That's the gospel. Timaeus might be an old Chaldean word, just mean blind. So think about this. Bar Timaeus, Bar is son of Timaeus, a blind person. It just means this is the son of a father who is blind. To tell us that this is a hopeless situation. He is the son of a man who is also blind. He is blind. Jesus is the only one who cares for people like these. And as the church throughout history, if you study history of the church, you realize that the church at times, it did not represent the heart of Jesus. At times, it became so powerful that it oppresses the people. But throughout all of the history of the church, there's that thread of Jesus. The heart of Jesus persists throughout history. The church has always been caring for people like Bartimaeus. Always have, and it always will. That is the true church of Jesus Christ. Because if we don't care, if the church stop caring for those who are like Bartimaeus, then we will not exist. We are not sitting here today. But because people have gone before us, and when we were stiff-necked, difficult, wayward, some people care enough to pray for you, to pray for me, to come and ask us and introduce us to Jesus. So Jesus alone cares. The church alone cares. And in the world that we live today, the news events that we hear, how does that compel you as a Christian to respond to the things that you hear? Maybe it's not something that's big as something that's happening in Afghanistan and in Israel or in other parts of the world where calamity and catastrophic things happen. Maybe it is in your own home. Maybe your family is broken, is hurt. Maybe your brother, your sister, maybe your children are hurting. What would move us out of the side watching and into the place where the action is and become Jesus? Bartimaeus, I don't know. I was thinking about this message. And I'm thinking, Bartimaeus must be sitting by the roadside, waiting. I don't think he was waiting. I think he was just existing. What was he waiting for? All his life, just like that man who was by the poolside, 38 years, waiting for someone to throw him into the water when the angel came down. Nothing until Jesus came. I don't think he was waiting. 
And I don't think many of us are waiting for anything. Then we're just existing, hoping without any definitive goal. But Jesus changed all that. He should. You should have a hope. And if I ask you, what is your Christian hope today? And if I ask you to write it down, what is your Christian hope? And next to or below that line, I ask you, if you ask Jesus for something, now if I ask you to write down, what is your Christian hope? What is it that you are hoping for? Right now, where you are, what is it? We're living in a time where hopelessness is so common that we're not even thinking about it. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 begins like this. And they came to Jericho as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd. So imagine with me, Jesus leaving Jericho. His disciples were with him. And there's this great crowd gather around him, moving it with him. Wherever he goes, they go. Bartimaeus, a blind beggar. Now, the disciples were not named, but this man. Somehow, Mark wants us to know this man's name. His name is Bartimaeus, the son of a blind father. Bartimaeus. Remember this name, Bartimaeus. A blind beggar, son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. Jericho at the time is considered, I quote, one of the most filthy and neglected places in Palestine. We find Bartimaeus sitting there by the roadside in his dreadful place. He's just existing there waiting for people to give him something, arms. It was here that the Lord visited Jericho and in extension, Bartimaeus. This curated life that we have made for ourselves, increasingly they are more and more abundant because the reality gets worse and worse. And so we retreat, I would say, to the side of the road and have our own view of what we want reality to be. We edit out the, the horror. We edit out the ugliness of life, and we replace that with something that's glittering, something that's unbelievable, these fantastical feat that people do. But it's just fingertip out of reach. You can't get it. So you sit there, and you continue to scroll through. This make-believe fantasy will cause us to be unable to differentiate between what's real and what's make-believe. And so we become blinded to what's real. And what's real is the beauty of God. We can't see it. We're so inundated with an alternate real reality that we become blinded to the plight of human suffering. And it is in this place that the church becomes so central to our generation that the eyes of this generation, that the eyes of all children must be open so that they will see something that is not a fantasy created by this digital media engine that's generating unending footage of something that is make-believe. And we are sucked into it. Your children, you, are sucked into it. I'm sucked into it until I snap myself out of it and say, wait, this is not real. And some of us, God forgive us, contributing to this effort, a blinding people to the reality of life. A broken life. At some point in life, you run out of strength. I run out of strength. For the past months, I could not move freely as I did before. I'm not as, as well 
as I was one month ago. To tell me that our strength runs out, your strength runs out. And you think that you can perpetuate, you can continue to be strong and healthy, wakes up at every morning. You know, every time I walk out the door in the morning, in the early morning, and as I walk down the steps, I never thought about it months ago. But recently, I thought about this. What if my leg gives out? Then I stumble down the stairs. It could happen. It could very well happen. I'm not no longer in control of my body. It's breaking down. At some point in your life and in my life, we no longer have the ability to say, I'm going to get up this morning, I, and I'm going to do this and that. And James tells you, reminds us that Lord's willing, we can. But if he doesn't, we can't. So remind yourself, our life, we have a time, we live, and then we die. Ecclesiastes tells you there is a season, and this is the season in my life when I am reviewing what I'm doing. And if I, and you have the strength right now in the prime of your life, those who are in your early 20s, those who are in late teens, think about this. You are in the prime of your life. What are you doing in reality, not in virtual reality? And when your strength runs out, you get pushed to the side like Bartimaeus. You're no longer useful for our society. Sit over there, beg, wait, get out of the way. No one's care. Let the new generation come up, let they take your place, because you're no longer valid. In this desperate and hopeless condition, the Son of God comes. Jericho represents our world today. It's broken. When you think about Jericho, what do you think about? The wall coming down. You think about destruction. You think about annihilation of a people. The only person who's left at Jericho is the harlot. That's the image of Jericho. But in this desperate situation, Rahab, the harlot, becomes the lineage of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in this desperate moment, I believe that the church is the answer. The church is the light for our generation. If we would wake up, if we would shine, if we would get out of the wayside. It is in this moment that the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our broken life. If you are whole, you don't need him. But if you are sick, if you're unwell, then you need a physician. Are you sick? I'm sick. I need Jesus. But if you're well, you don't need him. The seed of the gospel, verse 47, and when he heard, this is Bartimaeus, when Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus Son of David, have mercy on me. Now, somewhere in his life, Bartimaeus' life, he must have heard about Jesus, but he never encountered Jesus. When the gospel is preached, we might not think that it affects anyone, but when the gospel is preached, the seed goes out there. This one seed went out there and touched Bartimaeus. And in due time, and this is the time when Jesus comes, Bartimaeus become awoken by the seed that was planted. The news of Jesus arrived, and now he gets a chance to meet Jesus. So what did he do? He calls out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The saving power of the gospel is when those who heard it call out to be saved. In Romans chapter 10, Verse 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, shalt thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. 
the gospel is preached. Bartimaeus heard about Jesus. And now he responds by calling out, Jesus, son of David, save me. Jesus knows that he's blind. Jesus knows his condition. And I believe that Jesus was there for him. But Bartimaeus needs to call out so that people know that he wants to be saved. Do you want to be saved? Do you want Jesus to save you? Then with your mouth, the Apostle Paul says, cry out. Make a confession. Jesus saved me. Bartimaeus called out to the only name that could save. No one else. No one ever could. And no one in the future, in the past, can heal someone who's blind. We're talking about heal. We're not talking about fixing here. We're talking about complete restoration of sight as if he was born able to see. No one has ever been able to do this and no one will ever be able to do this. The only person who is able to do this is the creator. God created me. He knows what's wrong with me and he can heal me, not fix me. He can heal me. He can restore me. Now, he has given me a name, the name of Jesus. He's given us a name. And Bartimaeus latched onto this name, and he called Jesus of Nazareth in the account of Luke. What's interesting here is in Luke's account, chapter 18, verse 36, Bartimaeus asked the the crowd what was happening. So he heard about Jesus, but then he inquired, what's going on? Because he couldn't see. And the people there says, the Lord is here. Luke chapter 18, verse 36, I want to show you something. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what it meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Luke must have had the account of Jesus went to Nazareth and preached at the synagogue. And you remember what happened after he preached at the synagogue in his hometown? They chased him out. They rejected him. That Jesus, someone who was rejected, is coming to Bartimaeus, who is also rejected. He's a friend of sinner, not because he's not rejected, but because he is. He was rejected so that we can be accepted by God. So I believe this relationship, when Luke makes this relationship between Jesus of Nazareth and Bartimaeus, Being heard, the people says, this Jesus of Nazareth, the Jesus who was a Nazarene, who was rejected by his own people, is coming to you, Bartimaeus, who is rejected by society. Verse 48, then comes the challenge. What is faith without challenge? And many rebuked him. Many Not just one person, many rebuked him, as he called out, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So instead of being silent, instead of being silenced by the crowd, just imagine a blind beggar by the roadside. You can't see anything, and you cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the people said, Bartimaeus, be silent. But not one person. A lot of people telling him, be silent. Master doesn't want to you, doesn't care about you. What do you how do you respond? Sorry. Won't do it again. I'm just going to retreat to my corner over here and I'll just stay silent. But not Bartimaeus. You know why? There's nowhere else to go. Nothing else that he can do. He's blind. Now, in your circumstances, in my circumstances, I can still go to the doctor. But then I went to the doctor, and there's no help. So where do I go? I can stay silent and wait for another doctor. Where do you go? If you still have a way to go, if there's another side of the road that you can go to, then you go there. 
But if you realize there's nowhere else for you to go, like Bartimaeus, there's nowhere else for him to go. There's no one else who can help him. And everyone is telling him to be silent, to be quiet. He said, no, I'm not going to be silent. I'm not going to be silent because there's nowhere else for me to go. And here's my only opportunity. Here's my only chance. And so he cried out, and the, the gospel writer says, even more. He cried out louder, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You know, overcoming embarrassment is hard. When the crowd shush you, you want just to disappear. Especially now, everybody pull out their phone and start recording. Pretty embarrassing. But your faith needs to be challenged. When you say you believe, when we say we believe, when you're in situations where it is difficult for you to express your faith, when you pray, and everyone else just start to get in and start eating, but you stop, you give honor to the Lord, you pray. That can be embarrassing. When everyone else curse the name of Jesus and you say, no, no, no. That's my God. Don't say it in front of me. That's embarrassing. When they say, wow. You're like a fundamentalist. You're a fanatic. That's embarrassing. But your faith is challenged. Are you embarrassed? Be around the people that you love. Are you embarrassed to hold their hand? Sorry. He needs to overcome his embarrassment, his shame. And he did. There's nowhere else he can go. No, no one else can save him. Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Second question I ask you, what is your hope? What is your Christian hope? The answer to that is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are two revelations. There's the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God as it presents here today when you call on his name, he reveals himself to you. That is your Christian hope. The Christian hope is when you call on the name of the Lord, you shall not be ashamed. When you call on the name of the Lord, he will come and he will save you. When you call on the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ will show up and say, I am here. What do you want me to do for you? Your Christian hope is he will never leave you nor forsake you. And when you come to him, he will not push you away. Say, I can't help you. This is beyond me. Your Christian hope is whatever sin that you have committed, is under the blood when you come to him and said, God, help me. I can't overcome this. I'm addicted to this. Only you can help me to overcome. Help me. He will come. And this is your Christian hope. He will save you. He can save alone can save you. And that is your Christian hope. And the other, at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ when all eyes will open and see the Lord of glory descending, and we shall ever be with him forever. That's your Christian hope. On the other side of Bartimaeus, put ourselves in the, the, the role of the disciples and the people who, who were with Jesus. We're with Jesus. We're coming out of um, Jericho, and probably on a mission. Jesus is on a mission going, well, to Jerusalem. 
So they're pretty excited about what's happening next. He's going to come into Jerusalem. He's going to drive out the authorities there, set up his new government there, and he will reign forever, and the kingdom of Israel will be restored. So that's the hope. So everyone is pretty excited about Jesus coming into Jerusalem and show the power of God, destroying the enemy, drive out the Romans, drive out all the evildoers, and reestablish his kingdom there, restore the temple, bring back, hopefully, the worship, the sacrifice, the temple. Well, we know that didn't happen. But they're pretty excited about what's happening. So as they are going out of Jericho and into Jerusalem, there's this, there's this squeaky voice on the side of the road. Jesus, save me. We're busy. We, we, we have somewhere to go here. So be quiet. Don't bother the master. Luke chapter 4. Verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he had anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. This is Jesus' mission. This is what Jesus come to do. And Bartimaeus is where and who he needs to meet. So his mission is to come for the people and to bring the people into his kingdom. Coincidentally, this passage is quoted from Isaiah. He was in Nazareth when he spoke this message to the people at the synagogue. And after he spoke this, they wanted to kill him. And here, as he fulfilling his mandate, his mission, people want to prevent this from happening again. Matthew twenty three thirteen. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, but you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. The story of Bartimaeus remind the church that sometimes in, in pursuit of piety, maybe, or holiness, we become sanctimonious in our behavior and the way we act toward people who just want to come to Jesus. Verse 49, and Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they call the blind man, saying to him, take heart, get up, he's calling to you. Jesus stops for Bartimaeus. Jesus stops for all those who call out to him. The scripture says, if you call out to Jesus, you will not be ashamed. Neither the disciples nor the crowd have the time to care about this blind man. But the Lord cares. The Lord cares about us. Not because you're perfect, not because you, get, you got your act together, but because you're imperfect. Because you haven't got your act together. Look at his disciples. Just take a look at them. A group of ragtag, even... In there, there's one that just wanted to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. He surrounded himself with the people that we might not want them to be our friends. Just imagine you have a guy like Peter in your company. Here he goes again. He's going to say something that's going to embarrass all of us. But Jesus surrounds himself with the people that we don't like, that we don't want, because he's here to transform us, to change us. Not to change our behavior, but to change our heart. And Jesus says, if your heart is cleansed, 
the outside will also be clean. Mark's decision to give the blind man a name reminds us that he's not simply someone on the side of the road. He's a person. He has a name. Martimaeus. Everyone. You might not know their name, but they have a name. And Jesus cares for them. Should the church care for them? Should you care for them? Everyone has a name. Despite how annoying and difficult and ugly and filthy you might perceive them to be, they have a name. Jesus cares for them. And Jesus challenges and changes our assumptions. The power and authority of Jesus call, call him, he says to Bartimaeus. And what happened? Let's look at the verse again. Jesus stopped and said, call him. And they called the blind man and listen to what they says. Take heart. Get up. He's calling you. When Jesus calls you, people will make a way for you. The crowd, they might be there, but when Jesus calls you, a way will be made for you to come to Jesus. That is certain. You see, when Jesus speaks, people's heart changes. A couple of verses before, be silent, be quiet, and now take heart, get up. He's calling you. There is authority and power in Jesus' word. And when Jesus calls you, when you call out to him and he responds with his calling to you, people will make a way. There will be a path for you to come to Jesus. Do you believe it? Leaving the roadside, verse 50, and throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus with all confidence. And now, a road, a way is made for Bartimaeus. He got rid of his cloak. He jumped up and began to make his way to Jesus. There, there is a transformation that happens when the word of Jesus is spoken over you. Now you see, here's the relationship that I want you to make. Jesus told people to call Bartimaeus. Think about that. People the church, you are the ones who will carry Jesus' voice to the Bartimaeus of our world, of our time. You are the one who will call to Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, the Lord calls you. Here, let me show you to Jesus. Did you see that? You are his voice. You transmit his voice, you carry his voice, and you change because Jesus changes the way we interact with people who are broken and hurt. And when Jesus calls you to call someone, you are making a way, you are leading them to Jesus. You are changed, and they will be changed. Both will be changed. I think that's just an incredible thing. And when Jesus touches you, the old things are passed away. The cloak, everything else is gone. There's new life. He jumps up, he gets out of the roadside and coming to Jesus. The journey with Jesus begins when we leave our familiar place. Next thing that happens is a conversation with Jesus. So the first thing that happens is Jesus calls out to the church to call out to the world. When the world hears of Jesus, they will respond. But then they need to have a conversation with Jesus. And here's what happened in verse 51. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The question I asked you in the beginning. What do you want Jesus to do for you if Jesus were to ask you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight, obviously. Is it? Here is the testimony. A blind man asking to be seen, to be heard, to see again. Do you have the audacity to ask Jesus for something that is impossible? Do you? Would you? 
So what did you write down? If Jesus were to ask you, what do you want me to do for you? Do you think about the things that you can do? Or do you think about the things that only God can do? Jesus, I'm blind. Can you take me and put me in a comfortable place? Can you get people to surround me and help me and feed me and not give me grief? Can you help me to, to be in an environment where it is commodious to my condition? It sounds strange as I'm putting it that way, but the way that we pray today is like that. We're praying for things that we know that can't happen. But I want you to be like Bartimaeus today. Pray for something that only God can do. If it is something that you can do, then go do it. Make arrangements. Find people. Befriend people. Make them like you. Let them take you. Be persuasive. Let them take you into their house. All those things we can do. We don't need Jesus. But ask Jesus for something that is only God can do. Ask Jesus for the impossible. And I challenge you that to strike out if the thing that you're asking Jesus to do is something that someone can do for you, cross it out. Replace that with something only Jesus can do. Come to Jesus. He will show you his power. Do you believe it? I believe it. Jesus knew that Bartimaeus was blind. Do you know that you're blind? Does Bartimaeus know that he's blind? Of course. Everybody knows. If you're blind, you know. Do you? John chapter 9, verse 41. If you were blind... You should have no sin, but now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. Did the Pharisee know that they are blind? Do we know that we're blind? We're blind spiritually. Do you recognize that? And if you do, this is my prayer. This is my prayer for you. This is my prayer for me. God Jesus opens my spiritual eyes so I can see what is happening to this generation. What's happening to this church? What's happening to my life? I want to see. Do you know that you're a sinner and need to be forgiven? What do you want Jesus to do for you? Can you, like Bartimaeus, have an honest dialogue with the Lord about your condition and ask God to save you? Verse 52. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. I want to conclude with this. When Jesus touched Bartimaeus and he recovered his sight, Imagine someone who's blind, now able to see. He looks around and he sees the crowd. He sees things that he'd never seen before. I'm not sure if he was blind from birth or he was blind because of some accident. I don't know. But I'm assuming he has been blind for a long time and has not been able to see. Now, for the first time, he's able to see. If you are Bartimaeus, what would you do? It's like any movies or plays. You're going to run around. You're going to touch people. You say, hey, I'm, I am able to see again. You begin to experience all that is life has to offer you. Peop- things that people seem to be trivial to you, they are they're exquisite. They're beautiful. They're new. So you run around. Just like the ten lepers. Jesus healed them. And they went on their way. They're so happy that they're now cleansed. They want to experience life but not Bartimaeus. And immediately he recovered his sight, not a comma, not a period, and followed him on the way. 
What did Bartimaeus see? What do you and I, we need to see when our eyes are open? Can we all stand, please? Lord, open our eyes that the things that have not been seen will be revealed. Open our eyes that we are able to see the thing that is most exquisite, most beautiful, beyond everything else that we can ever imagine. Open our eyes so that we can see the Lord of glory, the Prince of life, our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer. Open our eyes that we might be able to see you in the splendor of your glory. That nothing else can compare. That all else will pale in comparison to seeing you. The love of our soul. Nowhere else, God, we desire to go. Nothing else we desire to see. No one else we desire to be with. Open our eyes that we would see Jesus. We see the love. We see your love for us. And draw our hearts to you, not just our sight. And that we would love you. And that we would follow you. Not out of duty or obligation. But God, out of affection and love and longing. Open the eyes of the church, God. That the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ will fill our heart with wonder and amazement that the name of Jesus is sweet in our mouth and on our lips. Open our eyes that we would see the wonder that you have in store for those who perceive you, who pursue you in this life and in the next. May your glory be upon this church. Everyone who hears the name of Jesus, who call upon the Jesus, who make a way for those who call on your name to come to you and be redeemed. In Jesus' name, amen.